Uh, hello everyone, my name is Marcus Placona. I'm a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. Uh, just out of interest, who's not heard about Twilio before? Cool, so uh, Twilio is a cloud communications API that helps developers like yourselves adding SMS messages, voice like telephone calls, chat, video, and two-factor authentication into your APIs. Uh, we have a stand out there, so if you want to talk to me about Twilio, come over and we can have a chat. We have some cool t-shirts as well. Now today, I, I'm here to talk to you about security, not about Twilio. So uh, there's some information on the screen about me. There's obviously my Twitter account, so feel free to tweet me at any time. There's my GitHub account. You wanna, you're gonna wanna make notes of that GitHub account because some of these samples I'll show you here today will be on that GitHub account. And there's the website, androidsecurity.info, which is the website I run uh, and where I talk about security. Some of the examples, some of the things I'm gonna tell you today are gonna be on that website. They're more descriptive, so feel free to just go and have a look at that. Uh, now, I want to start with a bit of a disclaimer here, because I am, I am not really a hacker, okay? I'm a software engineer, I work at Twilio as a developer evangelist, so I'm not really a hacker. And the reason I have to say this is because some of the things you're going to say, some of the things you're going to see here today, you may think, oh, I could have done that differently because I'm a real hacker or something. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, so a lot of the things I'm going to show you here today are things that I basically just found out I learned on my own. Uh, but I'm not, really, I'm not really a hacker. All of the hacks you're going to see here today, uh, the, everyone who's being hacked, everyone has been notified. Uh, I don't try and make money out of anything. I don't do for bounties or anything like that. Okay, so I do this to try and help developers. I do this to try and help applications that are prone to hacking. Uh, the one thing you need to know about me is, even though I'm not a hacker, I really care about security. I think about security a lot, I pester a lot of my friends with security, I pester a lot of them with, hey, I found this thing on your application, or how are you protecting your application? And today I want to try and make sure that I can show you some of those things, okay? Uh, let me just make sure I've got the right, cool. Now, uh, the next thing you need to know, and I'm going to give you one more disclaimer, and then we're going to get started, okay? So I just want you to go and have a real quick read on this, so it's really quick, so not, not too complicated at all. Uh, I, I hope you had time to go and read this. But the important thing about this, the important thing you want to know on this thing is, I haven't really hacked your app, okay? I have not hacked your app. All the examples you are going to see here today are examples of applications that may be similar to applications that you've already seen, but they're not really the applications you will have seen, okay? So I built applications very similar to the ones you've seen before, and the reason I have done that is because I found out that when you hack someone's application and you go on stage and you talk about it, companies tend to get suey, okay? And this is a totally made up term, uh, but a uh, company getting suey is they basically get annoyed when someone goes and breaks their toy and shows on stage, okay? So because I don't want to be sued, I made sure that uh, all of the hacks in here are my own applications. Uh, but let's get started. So we'll get started real simple here. I just want to show you this scenario where we have a client and we have a server, and I think you may have like, been in this situation before. If you built any applications and made any kind of HTTP requests, you will have seen something like this. So you have a client, the client makes a request to the server, the server then responds. So this is the expectation of a regular HTTP request. Okay, you pass some data, you get some data back. Now, we're going to introduce a new character into this equation here, which is, I, I will represent that as the pride flag. Uh, and this is very similar to what you've just seen me doing right now. So the pirate flag represents what they call the man in the middle. And uh, man in the middle attack is a very simple and effective attack where whenever a client makes a request to a server, someone intercepts it, so someone is in the middle getting those requests. And when that man in the middle gets the request, it passes on the request to the server. So as a user, as a client, you're none the wiser because you're still making those requests as you would before. 
As a server, you're also none the wiser because you get the request and then you respond. So you think, uh, on both sides, you think that you're doing the right thing, just passing information back and forwards. However, there's someone in the middle. And now, why is this important? And who can think of a hack that uh, happened uh, very recently that, was, that used men in the middle? Uh, this is important because of this. Is anyone still playing Pokemon Go? Yeah, good. I, I am playing Pokemon Go too, so uh, it's, it's not just you. Uh, so, Pokemon Go. Uh, this is, uh, if you've never played Pokemon Go, if you don't know what Pokemon Go is, I'll tell you right now. The motivation of Pokemon Go is you install that on your phone, you walk around, and you catch Pikachus. That's it, okay? So your motivation is to basically walk around and catch Pikachus. You have a map that is very similar to what you've seen on the screen. And with that map, as you walk around, you see your character walking and you catch Pikachus. However, the thing about Pokemon Go is you have to walk around. Like, you won't find Pokemons if you stay stationary. You need to walk around. And someone was like, well, that's a kind of a drag. I'm going to have to walk around to get Pokemons. So what did they do? They found that the Pokemon application was using an API in the back end. And they got access to this API because the, the application wasn't protected enough. When they got access to this API, they were like, OK, so what can I do with this? Can I pass some requests to this API to say that my character is moving? Sure enough. So if you are looking at this, uh, if you are looking at this picture, you'll see that there's some arrows. So everything that is sort of like highlighted in there, they did not exist on the official Pokemon Go application, okay? They were built by people who said, I can get access to this API, so instead of moving around, I can just press the buttons and my characters move around. Now, there's one thing, so Pokemon Go may not be uh, the, the thing that you care about right now, because you may be working on a banking application, but there's one thing that you need to keep in mind, which is motivation, okay? So stay with me on the motivation, because for these hackers, so for the, the kids who actually broke into the Pokemon Go application, all they wanted, all their motivation was, I want to walk around and I want to catch more Pikachus. That was the motivation. Okay, now, staying in the motivation uh, train of thoughts, has anyone heard of Kuba Gretzky? All right, so I'll tell you the story of Kuba Gretzky. Uh, Kuba Gretzky is a Polish developer who managed to hack an application. So this is a loyalty application. And this developer managed to hack it to get free beer. Now, there's one thing I always like to point out in this picture, which is uh, the picture shows, uh, if you can't read the bottom of it, it says, a strangely dressed man drinks beer. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are Polish. Uh, I have some Polish friends, and they definitely don't dress like this when they hack or drink beer. Now, the way Kuba Gretzky managed to hack this application, as I said, was through loyalty. It turns out that in Warsaw, there was a loyalty application where every single time you bought a beer, you would scan this application. So they would scan the application and give you an extra token on the application. So very similar to if you've been to Starbucks, for example, you take your Starbucks application and you get a star and every like 10 stars you get a free coffee, except that in this application in Poland, they were doing this for beers. Every five beers you bought, you will get a free beer. Okay? So remember when I talked about motivation, like catching Pokemons, buying free beer, getting free beers? So uh, that was Kuba Gretzky's motivation. He, he wasn't into Pokemons, but he was very much into beers. Now, Kuba Gretzky realized that the way this worked was the application, every single time you went to the bar, the application would make, a, would make contact to a near field communication. So it would make contact to one of those um, beacons. And the beacon would then pass information to the application. OK, so the application gets near to it. The beacon passes some information to it. And then the phone would make an HTTP request to a server. Now, if the beacon passes information back to the phone, you own the phone, so you can do whatever you want with it. And sure enough, this is what Kuba Gretzky did. He thought, well, if I put an HTTP proxy in the middle of this communication between my phone and the server, 
I can now know what information is being passed from my phone. So if my phone makes an HTTP request to a server to say, I get a free beer, how about I go and make some of those requests? And that's exactly what Kuba Gretzky did. So he found out that on the request, there was an authentication token. Okay, so this is the highlighted bit on the slides. There was an authentication token. This authentication token was in plain text. It was not, the, the, there was no encryption or anything, it was in plain text. He also found out that in this authentication token, there was information about the beacon. So he could just go and clone this beacon himself. He also found out that there were different things in different places where he could get this free beer. Uh, so he could always be changing his request. So it doesn't, it didn't look like he went and got a hundred beers from the same bar. Uh, he also found out that there were other things he could get, such as burgers and everything. But let's stay with beer. He was interested in beer. Okay. And sure enough, as you can see, so this is the actual request. So this is the, the real request. And as you can see, all it took was, well, you make a post request to it. And that's exactly what Kuba Gretzky did. So he kept on making requests and requests and requests. And up until today, it's unknown how much beer Kuba Gretzky actually got for free. Uh, all I know is that he drank a lot of beer. And uh, at some point when he, was, uh, when he was tired of drinking beer, uh, he wrote a blog post about this. So he wrote a blog post saying how I hacked an Android application to get free beer. This was back in 2016. The next time Kuba Gretzky blogged was in the middle of 2017. So he was like out for about a year, probably <laughs> still drinking beer. Uh, now, cool, this, is a, uh, this, was, this was a bit of a problem, okay? So uh, especially because, uh, you know, unlike the way I do things, he actually went and exposed those people. Like he didn't say anything about the name of the apps or anything, but he went and exposed those people in his blog. And there's a chance here that he may have got in trouble. Uh, but you know, it's, it's what happens. Uh, but let's talk about uh, what could have been done to stop this. Because, well, he, he was able to do that. And honestly, I only know that Kuba Gretzky was able to do that. But more people could have done that. There's a bunch of people there like, uh, whose, whose motivation is, you know, it, it kind of rounds around beer. Uh, so, Encrypting all the values is one of the things they could have done. And encrypting all the values is a super, uh, is a super simple thing. So I am going to be using examples in Android in here. Uh, all of the things I talk about will be applicable to iOS as well. So do, do we have, can I just see a show of hands? Uh, is uh, anyone building Android applications? iOS? Windows Phone? <laughs> okay. So. I will be showing some examples in Android. So Android is what I do the most. Uh, but everything I say here will be applicable to uh, any of the things that you're building. So uh, the first thing is adding something like a dependency just like this. So this is a, this is a really simple library that does AES encryption to your, to your keys. OK, so instead of just passing a big JSON file with all the information to be you know, ready to be uh, you know, read and, and, and replicated, they could have just like uh, encrypted values. Encrypting values is super simple. So in this case, you start by just adding a dependency into your code. You have a password and you have a string and you, you basically, you can encrypt your values and you can now go and decrypt those values. Okay, so really simple. But now you're thinking, OK, so I'm looking at this code. And uh, you've got a password on the code, which is also in plain text, right? So I'm kind of like going against myself here. Um, the passwords in this example is just so you know where the password goes. So um, don't, don't worry about that. You shouldn't be using a password like this. And I'll tell you how to uh, not have a password in the middle of your codes. Um, but the reason I'm talking about having passwords in your codes is like we're going to start moving towards a different story here. But the reason I'm talking about having passwords inside your codes is eventually your keys are going to end up in GitHub. Who's done that before? Like who's pushed the key to GitHub and went like, oh, shoot. Yeah, uh, probably more of you, but you don't want to admit this. Uh, so this is a, this is a different story. So uh, there's this guy called Luke Shadwick, and uh, he accidentally committed his AWS, he pushed his AWS keys into GitHub. And it was, a, it was literally a 20-minute mistake. 
So he pushed his keys into GitHub for 20 minutes. And what happens with AWS keys when they end up in GitHub is people, they, there's, uh, there's webhooks and there's, a, there's an API on GitHub, and people will be watching for those keys. They have regular expressions to watch for those keys. And whenever those keys end up in GitHub, what they do is they start mining Bitcoins. If any of you has ever mined Bitcoins, you will know that uh, first, it's, there's no way you can make money with this because right now. Um, however, if you're mining those Bitcoins for free, then all the money you make is free. Uh, so what they do is they spin up a bunch of uh, they spin up a bunch of new instances on AWS and they start mining bitcoins with those. Okay, and uh, in fact, what happened to Luke Shadwick was he got a bill of nearly three and a half thousand dollars in 20 minutes. Okay, because it was the time between he realized that his key was in GitHub until the time he managed to get in touch with Amazon and say, hey. I need this. I, like I need this key rotated because I made a mistake here. Uh, but he that gave him a bill of three and a half thousand um, dollars. He later he did an update to this blog post. So there's there's a there's a happy ending here because later he did an update to this blog post saying, well, I contacted Amazon and I asked them to rotate my keys. They rotated and there was still money coming out of my account. It turns out there was caching on those keys and people could still use it. Uh, so he was, he was waived that bill, so he didn't have to pay the three and a half thousand uh, dollars. But obviously in a, in a regular scenario, no one would say, I'm gonna give you money back, it's okay, because it wasn't you mining Bitcoins. Like they, they have no way of knowing this. So, uh, and that's why I'm saying you shouldn't have any keys in your applications and I'll show you how to do that how to not have keys in your application. Now, the other thing they could have done is utilizing security features when they existed. Remember, I talked about beacons. Uh, if you are using something like this, you want to make sure that you protect them somehow. The beacons we looked, they had their keys and their UIDs and everything all in plain text. As it turns out, there are ways you can uh, you can encrypt your beacons. So when they pass information around, they're passing uh, encrypted information. I'm using beacons as an example. I, I don't want to sound like a hater who hates beacons, although I hate beacons. Um, but this goes to many different things, okay? This goes to many different other hardware that you can be using that you need to make sure that you are protecting, that you're protecting yourself when it's got, uh, when it's got a way to be protected. Now, the next thing they could have done is using certificate pinning. Has, who's heard of certificate pinning here? So if you haven't heard about certificate pinning, the way certificate pinning works is you basically pin your application, your mobile application to your server. So if you're using a, an SSL key, so if you're using an SSL certificate, you're now, say, you're now saying only my app can make requests to this HTTPS website, and this HTTPS website will only respond to my app. So you're pinning the two of them. You're saying, App exists, websites exist, you only talk to each other, don't talk to anyone else. So in that case, if they had used something like certificate pinning, for example, Kuba Gretzky wouldn't have been able to make HTTP requests, HTTPS requests because he doesn't have the certificate with him. Now, certificate pinning is, uh, here's just another example of what certificate pinning is like. I'm using a library here uh, called, called um, OKHTTP. OK and the way certificate pinning works is you set up a host name, so you tell what host name your application is gonna be looking at. Uh, you, have a, you have a public key here, which you can add into your code, and then you just say create certificate, so pin certificates, and that's it, okay? So you're basically just adding what, about seven to 10 lines of code uh, to your application, but now you're saying, whenever you make a request, make sure you make a request to this place. And you do the same on your server. Uh, now the other thing is, and this is probably the most important thing, because we're very used to we're very used to saying, oh yeah, no, we have servers, and servers are protected, and there's someone taking care of it. But when you move away from a server and you're running on a device, the user takes care of it. The user has access to do anything they want in that device. This is why they own the device. So do not trust the device, and I say do not trust the device, because eventually someone will decompile your application. Okay, and decompiling an application is easier than you may think. I don't know if you've ever done that, but decompiling something like an Android application or an iOS application is really easy. So 
I'll show you a little uh, video here of what decompiling an application looks like. Uh, so what I'm doing here is I have an APK, and there's this uh, tool called the APK2. I basically just say APK2 decompile, and it decompiles my application. So now I have access to all the code that is in it. And this is to say that if you have things in your codes that shouldn't be in your codes, such as API keys and stuff, then you should make sure that you get rid of those. Because in this example here, I had an API password and I, have an, and I had an API username. And they obviously shouldn't be in my codes because they are now people have access to my API. So they can make, they can do whatever they want to do with, with my API. This application is, so APK2 is not a hacker tool. It's not something I just went to a shady place and got. Uh, there's a website for APK2. It's, uh, it's an open source application. And developers basically use it to find out how vulnerable their applications are. So if you, if you decompile an application, you want to try and find out how vulnerable your application is. And then you will say, well, OK, so you're telling me not to have those things inside my codes, but I need those magic strings. I need to have, like, where am I going to store these things? Like, where am I going to store my keys if you tell me not to have them on my, on my codes? So uh, we're going to go through a few examples here. Uh, one of them is you can, first, if you are going to have those keys in your codes, if you decide to go that route, make sure you encrypt your keys. OK, uh, just like I said before, you can encrypt on one side, you can decrypt on the other side. Only you know the key. So if anyone else is trying to pass that key, uh, they, they won't be able because they won't know the encryption key. Storing keys on a server is another good example because now you have a server that you can protect. You can protect the server with, with HTTPS and you can use certificate pinning. So storing a key on a server means that key doesn't live in a device. That key is not inside my mobile phone. Now that key is on a server. I'm going to make a request to that server. I'm going to get the key. And this could be a one-time only request where you get the key and you store it in the device. And I'm going to talk to you about storing things in the device as well. Um, the other example I have, and this is something I actually really like, is storing keys on the NDK. So the NDK is the native development kit in Android. So you have the Android SDK and you have the NDK. NDK is where you go and write C++ stuff. Uh, that may sound uh, daunting to some of you. It definitely was daunting to me to go and do C++. Uh, but what happens is, when you decompile a Java application, when you decompile an Android application, you end up with just like plain text. Because the decompilers are good. And it's the same thing with decompiling an iOS application. The decompilers are super good. Now, when you have something that is lower level, like C++, decompiling is way harder. Because what you're going to end up with is something that either you're really good at hex editing, or you're just not going to be able to read it. Okay, So using something like the NDK, where you decompile a, a C++ module, is, is way, way harder. And the idea here is like there's not going to be a silver bullet. There's not going to be this one thing you can do, and it will protect your app. You want to make sure that you are building layers around your app. Okay? And one of those layers is, yes, uh, storing stuff in C++. Now, if you're thinking, well, that's, uh, that might be too much. So this is basically what it, uh, what it uh, means uh, to store something in C++. So I have a module here. Uh, this is basically a code that is copied and pasted from Stack Overflow. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit this. Uh, I'm not a C++ developer. Uh, but I have a key inside my, my C++ uh, code, my C++ module, and then I can just go and invoke it. So I can invoke that C++ module from my Android application. I know you can do the same thing with iOS. Now, that's all, that's all, all well and good. But let's say you make a request to a server, for example, like you use the server option to make a request and get API keys. What do you do with this now? Are you going to make a request every single time to the server, or are you just going to store that key? Uh, my preference is to go and store the key on the device. Okay, storing the key on the device is like if you're an Android uh, if you're an Android developer, I'm not talking about shared preferences. Like I'm not talking about if you're not an Android developer, shared preferences is like cookies. So I'm not talking about storing in shared preferences, I'm talking about storing in something like the key store. Uh, the way the key store works is it's hardware backed. So you basically have a chip 
on your Android device that will take care of encrypting uh, every single value that you pass on it. Uh, the one caveat about this is, well, there are actually two caveats about this, but one of them is it's really only useful on anything above API 23, so this is Android N. Uh, anything below that, uh, it, just won't be, it just won't be as great. Uh, because uh, Android N, uh, well, anything below Android N would just generate public keys, and you want to make sure that you're using symmetric uh, key generation here. So you want to make sure that you're using proper uh, keys when you use this thing. Now, adding, uh, adding this into your application is super simple. So what I'm doing here is I have a key generator, so I get an instance of key generator. Then I pass some properties into it, okay? So you don't need to, you don't need to memorize all those things. I'll be publishing those slides later. So I pass some, key, I pass some parameters into, the, into this, and then I create my cipher. And with my cipher, I'm now able to pass a string, any kind of string into it, and it turns into something that looks like nothing. Now, I, let me see if I can show you uh, an example here of this thing running. I have some code in here. So I have, a, I have a really, really simple application, which is, which is looking all blown up. Let me, um, let me run that again. So I have a really, really simple application. It's got two fields, one field where you pass a string in, and one field where you can see what comes out of it. Uh, oh, I'm going to have to close this because it's, it's looking all zoomed in. I zoom out. Oh yeah, here we go. Cool. So really simple application. It's got one field where you pass whatever you want to encrypt. It encrypts, and then you have a way to decrypt. You have a way to take it back. Okay. So remember, this in a device, any of the newer devices, this will be harder encrypted. This is as this is sort of the best you're going to get in terms of encryption because you're using harder to do it. You're not using software to encrypt. Uh, so this application has two classes. One that encrypts. So that's the stuff I just showed you and one that decrypts. So it just gets that, uh, gets the key stored in here, and it turns my, my, string, my, um, my encrypted string into something that is more readable. So I am going to, I'm going to type something here. So I'm, I'm going to type NDC, Oslo, and let me get rid of this keyboard. And when I click encrypt, you'll see that the stuff in red at the bottom is, the, is basically NDC Oslo encrypted. I can carry on encrypting this as many times as I want. It's going to change the value, but it will use my key. Uh, if I want to go in the crypt, I can just press the crypt, and then it brings me NDC Oslo back. Okay? So again, in a real device, not in an emulator like this, but in a real device, this will be using harder encryption, which is, uh, which is really what you want to use. So in this example, if you are using an API, for example, or if you are using a server, going to a server to get API keys, you're going you're gonna to want to use something like uh, this to store the keys inside the application. Cool. So let me go back to this. Now, there is, um, there is a, this is the second caveat, OK? If you're using any newer devices, like if you're using for Android devices, for example, if you're using any of the Pixel devices and everything, uh, that's going to work well. The, uh, the key store is a bit forgetful with older devices where there's no hardware encryption. And when I say forgetful, what I mean is if you have a bunch of keys stored in your device and you change your device's passwords, those keys are going to get corrupted. So you're going to lose those keys. Uh, so you, wanna be, you just want to be careful uh, with this, because it's a, it's a bit forgetful. Uh, it's obviously good for stuff like I said, if you make it an API request or something, it's good for that. Not so much if you have a password manager, for example. If you build a password manager and you're storing everything, and suddenly you're going to tell your users, well, yeah, actually, it's all corrupted now, uh, because they changed their passwords. Cool. So. I, so far, I talked about things that could have been done to stop this hacking. So things that could have been done to uh, not, not let Kuba Gretzky's, hack, uh, Kuba Gretzky's hack happen. But there are things that I, I feel like 
If you get to a point where you're trying to stop a hack, it's already too late, okay? So there are things that you could do proactively to stop a hack, and some of those things are um, adding tampering detection. So this is something a lot of developers don't know, but there are ways that you can tell whether your application is being opened, whether your application is being decompiled, and there are ways you can tell whether your application has been republished somewhere else. Uh, so tampering detection is, this is, a, this is one of the examples. Uh, what I'm doing in here is I am checking that the, um, I'm checking that the package name, so I'm, I'm checking that the package name is still the same, so no one changed the package name. I am checking that the, um, I'm checking who's the installer. So if anyone decompiles my application and decides to republish it elsewhere, um, this, is, uh, this is one way you can stop it. So I, I only want my application really to run on the Play Store or on the Amazon Store. As you know, there are a bunch of different uh, stores out there. And I want to make sure my application doesn't get, uh, doesn't get published elsewhere. Uh, checking your application signature is another thing. Only you have your signature. Whenever you create your certificate to publish an application, to package an application, only you have that signature, no one else will have that signature. Uh, obviously, that's the other thing that shouldn't be in GitHub. Uh, checking for the application signature again is super simple. So I have an application signature in my code, and if the application gets repackaged, I want to check against my signature. Again, this is in plain text over there. You shouldn't have it in plain text. You should have it on a server or something. But for you to be able to see, I decided to put it in plain text in there. Uh, there are URLs at the bottom of uh, most of the slides. So if you want to read more, you can just go into some of those URLs. Now, you'll be asking, well, OK, so you're telling me that my application, like someone's going to republish my application? Like, how? Why, why would someone republish my application? Uh, so I, um, I, I decided to do a search on Google, and my search was, if you can't read this, was my app was copied Android. So this is basically people Googling things like, well, there's something wrong in my analytics because I'm seeing like there's different markets and there's different people where maybe I, my application should only be available in the US, but now there's like people from Asia using it. What is going on? So I did a search for this. And I, I found out that the, well, the results are kind of staggering. So there's almost four and a half million people asking this same question. So as it, as it happens, there's a lot of different markets who will get your applications and will just like repackage them, republish them. And if you do, so the thing about repackaging and republishing is if you have an application that is free and like you don't make any money of it, it's just like for fun, it's okay. But if you have applications that actually generate you any kind of revenue through ads, for example, what people when they repackage applications, what they'll do is they'll use their ads ID. So they'll change your ID and they'll use theirs. Uh, so now they're making the money. So your application is available in a place where it shouldn't be and they're also making money out of it. And you're giving support, of course. Uh, checking for roots of devices is, uh, is another thing. So as it happens, you can root a device in both iOS and Android. Uh, they're just called different things, but it's the same kind of principle. So checking for roots of devices is if a device is rooted, it means you can now do anything on it. Like it's like going into your laptop and typing SU in command line. Now you have access to doing everything. You're a super admin. Uh, checking for roots of devices is super simple. What you try to do is, in your code, you can say, hey, I want to try and execute something like SU in here. And if I can execute, then that device is rooted. Okay? Now, talking about roots of devices, I am, this is a choice that you're going to have to make at some point, because if you're running, like I said, if you're just running a game or something, you don't want to stop people with roots of devices from using your, your laptop, because your, your application, because sometimes people will root devices for good reasons. Sometimes they'll have good reasons to do it. However, if you have something like a banking application, for example, then yes, you shouldn't allow people with roots of devices to use it. Because once a device is rooted, most of the things I talked about here, most of the things I talked about when it comes to like protecting your application, they go down the drain. Because now that you can, as a user, you can do anything with that device. So they kind of go down the drain. So you want to you wanna look out for that. Um, 
Exposed is a, is a framework that uh, a lot of people use, a lot of hackers use, and many people don't know about. What Exposed does is it has, it's a, it's not necessarily a hacking framework, but it's a framework that you can install into a device, and now you get access to different things inside of it. One of the different things you get access to is hooking. And hooking is basically a way for you to listen to callbacks from applications, any applications. So if your application has a callback to something like a button, has, a button was pressed, or banking application, or if, if your phone uh, has something like banking application has been opened, uh, hooking can get access to it. So basically now people not only, they don't, they don't only know that your, you have things installed on your phone, but they get access to what you're doing inside those applications. And hackers use that a lot to get access to what servers these applications contacts. Because you may, be, you may try and do things like, oh yeah, I'm going to be super protective about like, going to a server and everything, and I'm going to try and be clever. But with hooking, there's not many ways you can protect your application from people getting access to things on it. Uh, luckily, there are ways you can detect whether a mobile device has something like exposed installed because exposed injects a jar file into your into your device so you can get access to this so you can you know you can basically find out whether someone is is trying to do anything dodgy with the phone uh, like i said routing is routing is one thing so people will sometimes have real reasons to root their phones i don't see why someone will have real reasons to have something like exposed so i I personally would block anyone who's using Exposed from using my application. Uh, checking for emulator is, is, uh, is also uh, something that would block, because I never built an application before where I felt like there was a need for someone to use with an emulator. Like, I build applications to run on phones. I don't want them to be on emulators. And as it turns out, most of the hacks, they come from emulators because it's much easier. It's much easier for you to use an emulator and control an application than for you to use the phone because you can, with an emulator, you can do things like use proxies and everything. So checking for emulator, this is a bit of a, this is a, bit of a, a big one, but checking for emulators is simple in a way like you know you can have this in a in a utilities function where you're checking for things like where is this thing running is it in a generic is it in an emulator does it say genie motion so it's almost like you checking headers of where the requests are coming from and if it's coming from an emulator you can say no you can't you can't use my application and and that's a that's a, a fairly simple way of checking for things like emulators uh, check if the application is debuggable. So this is a fun one because every time I say, well, yeah, no, you should check whether your app is debuggable, you go, well, but I published my application. So surely it's in release modes and not in debug modes because I published this on the Play Store. Um, so checking if an application is debuggable, and I'll tell you why I'm, I'm talking about this. So checking if an application is debuggable is just like you're checking for a flag. So if the application is debuggable, true or false, uh, you, you're checking for this flag, and that's it. Now, the reason you want to do that is because changing an application to being debug mode is like really easy. Uh, so I have my my example application here, where I I decompiled earlier, and if you didn't see my change here, all I did was I changed the Android debuggable from false to true, and now this application is debuggable. When an application is debuggable, you can do anything with this. Like you get access to all the logs and everything, which you wouldn't get from, from, a, from a release mode application. So these are just a few things that you can do. And like I said, nothing is, nothing is the silver bullets here. Like there's no silver bullets. There's no one thing you can do. It's a conjunction of a bunch of things you can do that will help you uh, protecting your apps. And this is usually the time when people look at this People have been sitting for, uh, yeah, for like, what, 40 minutes now? And they go, well, okay, so I'm, I'm slightly confused about like, all this, because like, you talked about a bunch of things I can do, and I haven't done any of those things so far. What should I do? Should I go back from the conference and tell my boss we're going to delete the app and start again? No. Uh, so the good news is there are tools that will help you out with this. So some of the examples I gave you here will obviously be helpful to you, but there are tools that you can use. 
Uh, a couple of tools I recommend, and I only recommend them because they're good, like I get no, uh, I get no commission for uh, recommending those tools. Uh, ProGuards and DexGuards are two tools I use very often. Uh, the cool thing about ProGuards is if you're building a new-ish Android application, for example, ProGuards is installed by default. Uh, it does things like name obfuscation, for example, so it will change your, your class names or your method names where you have something like get user credit cards. You shouldn't have that, but if you do, uh, it will change those things to something that is uh, less uh, readable. So it does name obfuscation, it does codes optimization for you as well. If you have methods and things that you're not using, it will just get rid of them. Um, DexGuards, which is, it, which is uh, its counterpart, as you can see, it's just the logo upside down. Uh, it does uh, different things such as class encryption, so it will actually encrypt your classes. So even when you go and decompile an application like I did, when you open the class, that class will also be encrypted. So it does uh, class encryption. It does stuff like core hiding, string encryption, certificate checks. So certificate checks is basically the certificate pinning I've been talking about, where we did it manually. DexGuard just does it out of the box, which is cool. It does debug detection. It does emulate detection. So all the, most of the things I talked about here, DexGuard just does it for you. And then you're thinking, oh, that's really cool. So I could just go and use DexGuard. Yep. Biggest difference here is ProGuards is free, uh, DexGuards costs money. So obviously, if you have something like a banking application, for example, like I said, you're probably, go you're probably gonna wanna go towards the DexGuard uh, sort of uh, way. Uh, it does things like root detection, for example, which is what I mentioned. Hackers get clever and clever all the time about routing. So you will have a way of detecting root today and a hacker will find a different way tomorrow of like bypassing it. Uh, DexGuards, they basically keep on top of it. So they make sure that uh, their root detection is very efficient. Uh, so the, the, difference is, the difference in here is like how big is your application? How much money can you lose if someone wants to take uh, charge of it? Uh, different things that you can look at is Safety Net API, for example. So Safety Net API is a free API by Google that you can add into your applications, and it will do a number of cool things for you. It will check if the device is compatible. In this case, if you're talking about Android development, it will check, is that device compatible to the Play Store? Yes or no. If that device is not compatible to the Play Store, you can make a choice. Do I let them carry on, or should my application only be on the Play Store? Only the devices using this application should be compatible. It will check for routing as well. And again, I showed you one way of checking for routing. This is probably going to be more complete, because like I said, they will be keeping tabs with how routing actually goes and how far you can go with, um, with, uh, uh, with different ways of routing a device. Uh, implement uh, network security configuration. So that's another thing I would, uh, I would recommend. Again, this is a free API by Google, and it does a few things for you. So it does certificate pinning for you. Uh, it does debug overrides. So even if someone goes and changes the application from debug equals false to true, this thing will just go and revert that. Uh, the slight caveat is it only works for Android, from Android N. And I think you can see a pattern in here where I said, if you, uh, if you, you want to use the key store, you want to use that from Android Zen and above. So Android Zen was basically on the source of like Android worlds. Android Zen is basically when Google says, no, we need to stop this. Like we need to stop with people hacking applications and everything. Uh, so this is where uh, everything kind of changed. Uh, there are alternatives, you know, a lot of the codes I showed you here are alternatives to using this thing. So if you are building applications in, different, uh, for different mobile devices or for older mobile devices, there are obviously the alternatives. Now, um, with that, uh, so this is an image I, I really like. Um, and the, the, the reason I like this image is because things aren't always what they look like. Uh, people, especially users in mobile devices, like you should definitely not trust them. You should definitely not trust people because it's their phone and they'll do whatever they want to do. Like they, they have access to their devices, they're going to do whatever they want to do. Uh, so I, I, I like to, like to kind of close with this image because things aren't, 
things aren't always what you, um, what you expect. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to put my information on the screen and say thank you very much. See you. Now, we do have some time for questions, if anyone wants to ask me any questions. Uh, well, I don't see any hands, so I'll be around. Uh, if you have any questions, just come to me. Thank you.